the Second World War, the industrialized world produced one million tons of chemicals a year. By 2005, it was five million. The post-war boom saw mass production, the frenzy of progress, consumerism and petrochemical magic create the unbreakable baby bottle and plastic cutlery. Crude oil, like everything else, is made up of billions of tiny molecules. And using the magic of research, oil companies compete with each other in taking the petroleum molecule apart and rearranging it into, well, you name it, fabrics, toothbrushes, tires, insecticides, cosmetics, weed killers, a whole galaxy of things to make a better life on Earth. We know that there are about 80 to 85,000 chemicals that are in commerce today. And about 7,000 high production, high volume chemicals. Most of these have not been tested for safety. So that's sort of the bottom line. But then you could say, so what? So they're manufactured, they're great, they make all these products that this little film showed. But um, the first thing to realize is that they actually get into our bodies which I don't think was realized at that time. The perspective is unlimited. There are unlimited potentials. Yes, if you forget your waste products and all of these uh, chemicals that leach from the products, all of the contaminants, if you forget that. And that was the way we developed the modern world. We thought that everything is innocent until proven otherwise. Nobody would have thought that we would have over 200 different chemicals in our blood. So because they're there doesn't mean that they're causing toxicity, but none of those chemicals belong there. So where do they all come from? Chemicals began to share our daily lives, encrusted in plastic, in detergents and toasters, concealed in our food, in toys, in shampoo. They are invisible, but everywhere, including inside our own bodies. So, you know, I'm, I'm old enough, I watched this kind of thing. <laughs> and in fact, uh, when I was a child, uh, they would come down the streets spraying DDT to kill the bugs. And as kids, we would run behind it and think that was great to have this spray in, in our face. So the reason I say that is at that time, there was not an indication at all that any of this would produce bad products. We can find chemicals in the body pretty much everywhere we look. Um, you can measure urine, that's a very good way to do that. You can look in the blood. Um, you can look in the amniotic fluid of a pregnant woman. You can look at the cord blood when the baby's born, the meconium when the baby's born. You can look in the breast milk. Pretty much everywhere we look, we find measurable chemicals that come out of our environment. And important thing is that they are silent Modern comfort flows through our veins under unknown barbaric names. Members of the large family of pesticides, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, commonly known as DDT, atrazine, phthalates, bisphenol A, parabens, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, perfluorooctanoic acid. All this pollution perniciously intoxicates us every day within the privacy of our own homes. With the infatuation with modern products, we see the uh, demand for them and then the production of them and the onslaught of these chemicals into our lives. I could ask you, are you a smoker? Are you, uh, do you drink alcohol? And then I would know some of your exposures. But if I asked you, are you consuming phthalates or are you consuming bisphenol A, how would you know that? We 
live in a chemical world, chemicals have uses. They are very useful, that's why they are there. The price we pay is we are exposed. There's only one way around this. We need a, a very rational approach to balance better risks to health and, and usefulness. Raid here! Raid! 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 Yes, Raid. New bug killer discovery from Johnson's Wax. Use Ajax. Boom, boom. The foaming cleanser. Get things clean, just like a whiz. You'll stop paying the elbow tax when you start cleaning with Ajax. So use Ajax. Our ordinary everyday lives are full of chemicals which escape from surrounding objects. Some have a special characteristic. They are capable of hijacking our hormonal intimacy, blocking our hormones or imitating them and affecting their levels. They are called endocrine disruptors. An endocrine disrupting chemical is a chemical that in some way interferes with the body's endocrine system. So that's the system that produces uh, regulates and uh, deals with the body's many hormones like estrogen, testosterone, thyroid, and so on. And so an endocrine disruptor can interfere with either how much is produced, how much is uh, sent where it's supposed to go, if you will. They're, they're messengers. They carry information from one organ to the other. Natural hormones are produced by the endocrine system the hypothalamus, the pineal and the pituitary glands in the brain, the thyroid, the thymus, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, the ovaries in women and the testes in men. Adrenaline, for instance, is a hormone that helps to control stress. A lack of insulin may cause diabetes. Hormones are often highly potent, so uh, these messages and signals have to be finely tuned. It's like, you know, someone switches on a light and someone else has to switch it off again. So all these reactions on, off have to be very carefully controlled. And foreign chemicals that interfere with this in some way um, can have... Uh, fairly drastic, unwanted effects on our health. The body secretes the male sexual hormone, testosterone, in precise amounts and at specific times. No more, no less than necessary. A minute quantity is extremely effective. But endocrine disruptors found in plastics, phthalates for instance, can dupe the hormonal system and take over its mechanisms by blocking testosterone action. Endocrine disruptors interfere with subtle hormonal maneuvers. The result is like playing a Chopin sonata with a hammer. The study of endocrine disruptors is focused on what can go wrong when you introduce a hormonally active chemical into the body, a chemical that the body was not designed evolutionarily to deal with? There is something wrong with the way we humans act. We don't see something, so we assume that it doesn't exist. So this chemical is good to make plastic, so let's use it. This chemical kills insects, so that is great. When we produce a chemical, we are going to test it for what we think we should. And if it's not in our imagination, if it doesn't cross our imagination, we won't do it. There's a lot of established test systems, but with endocrine disruption, we have the problem that a lot of the effects we are concerned about are not answered by the available test systems. When experiments, I mean epidemiological experiments, reveal relationships between a chemical exposure and a disease, 
That was done in a way that you could separate the population that was ex exposed and the one that wasn't. Like, for example, people that apply pesticides in the fields versus people that live in the city. But when you talk about plastics, when you talk about things that are present in everyone's urine, in everyone's blood, then you don't have that luxury because you cannot distinguish a non-exposed population and an exposed population to conduct these human studies. It's this rapid adaptability, together with the attractiveness, usefulness, and low cost of the plastic itself, that has made this industry one of the fastest growing in the nation's history. What's it to you? Plastic, chemistry's greatest triumph, has gradually invaded our daily lives. Its production over the last 10 years is higher than that of the entire 20th century. But plastic contains several types of endocrine disruptors, Notoriously present in baby bottles, bisphenol A has the unfortunate drawback of imitating the female sexual hormone, estrogen. Some studies were conducted by the Center for Disease Control, for example, that found that more than 92% of the urines that they analyzed that correspond to a profile of the American population contained bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is used to make polycarbonate plastic and epoxy resins, which are the ingredients of printed circuits, kitchen rolls, plastic dishes, plugs, floor coverings, household electric appliances, refrigerators, washing machines, microwaves, mixers, hoovers, dishwashers, metal furniture, cash desk tickets, all sorts of tickets, glues and adhesive, water bottles, dental fillings, food packaging, car equipment, plastic recipients of all kinds, the inside coatings of tins and cans, hair dryers, protective glasses, sports helmets, rackets, skis, garden tools, cameras, glasses, DVDs, cosmetic tubes, water flasks, irons, televisions, razors, computers. France has banned its use in baby bottles. The bottom line is that we cannot measure exposure and outcome in humans anymore because everyone is exposed, because everyone is exposed through lifetime, and because we cannot integrate the daily exposures through a life to know whether there is a correlation. So we have to rely in animal studies. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, 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 no, no. <laughs> We expose animals in utero, as they were developing as fetuses, to minute amounts of bisphenol A. Then we follow all their development. Exposed to this chemical estrogen, baby mice display hyperactivity and behavior disorders. Then, as they grow older, become obese and develop tumors of the mammary glands and the prostate gland, amongst others. Now we have all this evidence in rats and mice that if you expose them to bisphenol A at minute environmentally relevant doses, you increase the propensity and at higher doses, you really produce cancer. The likelihood for a woman to develop breast cancer in her whole lifetime has increased from 1 in 22 in the 50s to 1 in 7 nowadays. That is threefold. So it can be done by modifying our gene composition. Obviously, this is a very short time. It has to be the environment. People have asked for a long time, when, are diseases due to genetics or environment? And now we know that the answer is yes. It's due to both genetics and environment. 
So if we're going to understand the etiology of diseases, what causes diseases, we have to not just understand the genetics part, but we have to understand the role of an environment. And environment really covers environmental chemical exposures, nutrition, stress, drugs, and infections. Well, we know that during development, for example, there are times where the developing organism is extremely sensitive to different kinds of chemicals exposure, both natural chemicals and synthetic chemicals. So while you might expose an adult to a chemical and have no effect at all, if you expose an embryo or a fetus or an infant, in fact, you might have an effect. It turns out we now understand that the most sensitive period for nutrition and chemicals to have effects on disease is really during development. The effects of chemicals are going to depend on the timing, they're going to depend on the dose, and they're going to depend on who's being exposed. With an environmental chemical, just for a few days they're in development, then the chemical is long gone, but later in life, after a long latent period, these diseases show up. So it's called the developmental basis of disease, because we believe that almost all these diseases that we have today have their origins during development. At least that is exactly what happens to mice and rats. When they are exposed to endocrine disruptors during pregnancy, their progeny develop hyperactivity and learning defects, insulin resistance, weight gain. In females, tumours of the mammary glands, abnormal ovarian pathologies. In males, prostate cancer, infertility, genital abnormalities such as the incomplete descent of the testes into the scrotum. In humans, too, adult diseases can be triggered in the fetus. Since the cancer registry was opened in Denmark in 1943, there had been a 400% uh, uh, increase in the rate of testicular cancer. So that was an amazing increase over one or two generations, and such an increase could only be due to environmental problems. There was a lot of science which suggested that testicular cancer originated very early in life, and our hypothesis was that it originated in fetal life, actually, although it did not manifest itself as a tumor in the testis until in adulthood. The hypothesis of a fetal origin of testicular cancer has now received support from really many studies from all over the world, and what, what is also apparent is that te testicular cancer development is associated with other abnormalities of the testes. And some of these abnormalities will be apparent just after birth. For instance, if the testis has not developed fully normally, it may not descend it into the scrotum at birth. Or if the penis has not been fully developed, there may also be an increased risk of, of testis cancer. So you have a, a group of, 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 of symptoms or diseases, you could say, that, that, that go to, are associated. And we, we actually now call this testicular dysgenesis syndrome. This syndrome is not only increasing in statistics, it is linked with a significant decrease in fertility by 1% a year. Men are producing half as many sperm as 50 years ago. It is low tide in the scrotums of the modern world. So our hypothesis was that if you had uh, hormones from outside coming into the testes and uh, disturbing this delicate balance which is in the developing uh, organ, then that could cause the same as genetic problems could. Listen to the sounds of freshness.
Among the suspects, some pesticides imitate estrogens. But there are also some plastic ingredients that have the regrettable habit of blocking testosterone. What has happened is that through this research we have become aware of new pathways in our bodies and new effects that weren't recognised before. A good example would be the plasticizers, the certain phthalates. They, uh, they turn out to interfere with the action of uh, male sex hormones in fetal life. Phthalates are in PVC, shower curtains, plastic floorings and surfaces, mats, detergents, sprays, water repellent materials, balloons, food film, windows, glues and adhesives, patterns on clothes, perfumes, cosmetics like lipstick and nail varnish, medicines, shampoo, aftershave, hairsprays and gels, gloves, zodiacs, games, hospital equipment, flip-flops, bottles, sneakers, shoe soles, cables and wires, insecticides and even in water hoses. It turns out that the genital tract originally in the very, very early embryo is neutral. It's sex neutral. And then there's development and it differentiates and it differentiates to the female or the male. Well, the female is the default. The, this genital tract will be female unless there is testosterone present. And so the amount of testosterone and the timing of the testosterone is absolutely critical for setting up a whole series, a whole cascade of changes which produce the male typical genitals. If that testosterone is not there or there's not enough of it or it comes at the wrong time, all of this process can be disturbed. And that's what phthalates do. There was one measure that was particularly important to the rodent toxicologist, so we we paid a lot of attention to that. And that's a, something called the anogenital distance, the distance from the anus to the genitals. In rodents, the male anogenital distance is twice as long as the female, on the average. Um, and when the mother has been exposed to phthalates, that male anogenital distance is shortened. The higher the dose, the shorter the anogenital distance until it becomes close to the female size. We wondered whether that happened in humans. Shana Swan and her team measured the levels of phthalates in more than 100 pregnant women. Then, when the babies were born, she carefully examined the baby boys in search of signs of feminization. What we concluded was that certain phthalates Two in particular were particularly uh, concerning are strongly related to the anogenital distance and they cause the boys who have this high exposure to these phthalates have a less male typical genital tract and genitalia. So they have shorter anogenital distance, they have smaller penises, and their testicles are more likely to be not completely down in the scrotum. So these are three characteristics of the phthalate syndrome, three that we could look at externally. Another family of endocrine disruptors is suspected of having effects on the brain and causing dyslexia or memory and attention disorders in children. It is the family of polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs, additives used to prevent fire to respect fire safety standards, they were stuck into inflammable objects and plastics right back in the early 70s. PBDEs hide in fitted carpets and rugs, washing machines, cookers, hods, toasters, refrigerators, mixers, irons, dishwashers, microwaves, mattresses and pillows, radio alarm clocks, pipes, tents, furniture material and fillings, couches, curtains, office chairs, printed circuits, 
fax machines, computers, printers, the packaging of all these objects. Light bulbs, plugs, cables and wires, batteries, car equipment, car radios, car batteries, ventilators, hair dryers, hoovers, hair curlers or straighteners, telephones, televisions, remote controls, DVD players, hi-fis, radios, etc., etc. Even in 1970, the levels of PBDEs in human either breast milk or blood were essentially non-detect, and that these levels increased very rapidly between 1970 and, say, 2000. To our surprise, the major route of exposure to these chemicals, at least in America, appears to be related to their presence in dust, house dust, office dust, car dust. When we think dust, we wonder how is it getting into people if it's in the dust? Well, little children we know are always putting their fingers in their mouth and they're crawling around on the floor. But in fact, dust gets into adults as well. And much of it has to do with people consciously or not putting their hands into their mouths. There are animal uh, toxicity studies that demonstrate that, that various flame retardants are neurotoxic. So it, essentially we have that um, evidence. But the problem is that animal brains are less complex than human brains, and we're not sure how to um, translate that evidence into risk assessment for humans. The first studies are, have ju are just being reported about the effects of the PBDEs in the human population. And what we're seeing in many cases mirror almost exactly the kinds of effects that we see in the animals. So I think it is reasonable to assume that the animal data is at least predictive or certainly suggestive of what may happen in people. After all, we are a kind of animal. Many modern plastics, however, are fire resistant. One of the numerous improvements science has made in plastic articles. It is going to take many, many years to get better evidence. Should we just wait and in the meantime, we just expose the children to all of, all of these chemicals and then uh, maybe we'll come back many years from now and find out that some of them were just as bad as lead. The extreme toxicity of lead didn't prevent its presence in our petrol for 60 years. The only pretext being that the proof was not irrefutable. But research takes time and scientists are not pizza delivery men. This model shows how just the right amount of fluid containing tetraethyl lead and dye is added to the gasoline. With lead, it took decades to document that children were suffering from uh, uh, adverse effects on brain development. They were losing IQ points, uh, losing um, various skills, memory, etc. And it took decades for us to get that information. And only now do we realize that lead is so toxic that essentially everybody in France, everybody in Europe, has a lead exposure that we cannot call safe. Even today, it's essentially a whole generation of children whose brains have been negatively affected. So all of these people who were born like in the 1960s and 1970s were to some degree affected by this pollution. Do we want this to happen again? I would say no. Therefore, we have to find a way to make responsible decisions in this regard on an uncertain basis. Science is never 100% certain. You always have to make decisions in the face of some uncertainty. But it's important not to require 100% certainty before we move ahead. And I do think that scientists are citizens and have a responsibility to convey the results of their understanding to other people. When you develop a brain, that is the brain you will have for the rest of your life. 
you get only one chance to develop your brain. Here is a recipe for concocting a contemporary disease. Marinate a group of endocrine disruptors in amniotic liquid of the 50s and 60s, and when these children of the synthetic age reach adulthood, note the increase of problems in public health statistics, of obesity, for example. For obesity, the critical factors are how much you eat and how much you exercise. And, and, and of course, that's really important because that determines your energy balance. But we think that there's more to it. Get set. People try so hard to lose weight, and 95% of people who lose weight within a year gain it back. So that tells us something, and it's telling us that there's some kind of a set point. And if there's a set point, that would have to be programmed in during development. The whole system is under a very tight control of, of, of hormones that are telling the body how many fat cells to make and exactly when to make them. So if you get an environmental chemical to come in and it can stimulate that pathway when it shouldn't be stimulated and therefore cause you to have more fat cells. And because that's happening during development when the fat cells are being made, then that effect is actually permanent. So the chemical is long gone, but the effect of that chemical lasts forever. We think what's happening is that the endocrine disruptors are actually stimulating the pathway to make stem cells become fat cells. So then you have more fat cells, and if you have more fat cells, they tend to want to be filled up with fat. About 10 chemicals can make rats and mice obese, even at low doses. Several pesticides, bisphenol A and perfluorooctanoic acid, found in Teflon. So far, there's actually a, quite a small list because this whole field is only about five years old. But it looks like every time you increase the female hormone estrogen during development, that that sensitizes you for obesity. This is where the destiny of a human being differs from that of the laboratory rat. We are indeed exposed to endocrine disruptors, imitating estrogens, blocking testosterone, or disturbing thyroid hormones at low doses. But this happens every single day of our lives. And above all, at the same time, a modern style cocktail with no nice intoxicating effect. We are not exposed to one agent at a time. You and I, we are exposed every day to five thousands of chemicals, certainly hundreds of chemicals, and, and some of those will act in concert. Some of those may not, may, may actually counteract each other. So it is extremely complicated research question. We are all exposed to a cocktail. However, when we identify a specific chemical that causes a problem, we need to understand not only how that can affect us in isolation, but how it affects us in the presence of many other chemicals. So scientists are doing studies now where they are looking at mixtures of chemicals and trying to understand what they will do. And in many cases, when we are at environmentally relevant doses, we find that the effects of chemicals appear to act in an additive fashion. Toxicology has the tendency to evaluate the effects of chemicals in isolation, a single chemical, certain effects. And for a long time it has been neglected to ask the question what happens when many chemicals work together. And this is 
where we uh, uh, made a contribution. And now it turns out that it is possible that uh, very low doses of chemicals, many chemicals together, can still have a pronounced effect. Okay. <laughs> In his laboratory, Andreas Kortenkamp takes such minute doses of endocrine disruptors that they have no effect in a test tube or on baby rats. Then he prepares a cocktail of chemicals that block testosterone. Let's say one phthalate, two pesticides and one drug. And then these supposedly harmless doses reduce the anogenital distance and cause penis and testis malformation. Now, my colleague Earl Gray has called this the new mathematics. Zero plus zero plus zero is something. And uh, it is not really new mathematics, but it, 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 it encapsulates this, uh, this quite nicely and quite provocatively. What it tells you is that if the effects of combinations are ignored, then we are in danger of, of making wrong assumptions about real existing risks. I feel many people, when they hear about mixtures, they... Uh, bury their heads in their hands and say, oh, this is too complicated, too many chemicals, we don't know where to start. But I think we are now in a position where we can bring back some order into this seeming chaos by saying many of these effects are predictable. And also now we have the tools to highlight chemicals that contribute very much to, to a mixture effect. The implications of our work for for regulation and risk assessment is, is quite important. There's no doubt that when you take mixture effects into consideration, risk estimates will, will go up. I think all the data in animals and the data we have in humans is, is leading us to believe that this is going to be a, a significant problem in, in human health. If it happens in mice, and it happens in rats, and it happens in monkeys, guess what? It will happen in humans, most likely. The work that I've been doing and my colleagues have been doing now for oh, 20 years, I would say, um, is uh, finding more and more evidence that they do have effects on our bodies and particularly on the unborn fetus. Uh, significant effects that may be, seem to be related to a number of pretty alarming trends uh, in health. In rich countries over the last 50 years, these trends in humans are indeed alarming. Abnormalities of the male genital tract have doubled. Testis cancer has become the first cancer amongst young men. Fertility has decreased by 50%. Prostate cancer is four times higher. On the women's side, it's not just breast cancer. The onset of puberty appears at around eight or nine in young American girls. In adults, the polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis and miscarriages have caused a raise in fertility problems. One European child out of five and more than one adult out of ten is obese. Diabetes increases by 5% every year. There are also cardiovascular diseases, immune system alterations, asthma and thyroid problems, not to mention hyperactivity, learning defects and behaviour disorders that seem to be increasing in children. In other words, pretty much the same diseases as those of laboratory animals exposed to endocrine disruptors. I believe there is now sufficient scientific evidence to, uh, to move into taking action or considering how, how we should 
uh, take account of mixture effects and probably reform some decision-making procedures. It's a very serious problem that we created and we have to deal with. So, I think, once all this is said, the Europeans came up with the precautionary principle that is a wonderful tool. So why on earth don't we use it? Why don't we use it? Excepting Denmark, which has published a guide for the information of pregnant women, public authorities are not really reactive or even talkative about this question. So people have to sort things out for themselves with fragments of information. It's impossible to be sure if there are phthalates in your holiday flip-flops, bisphenol A in your razor, or PBDEs in the remote control of your TV. And when labels do exist, they are minute and incomprehensible for the average person. It's a constant struggle now for us to try to figure out where these things all are so we can get the word out to help reduce the exposure. So what I do and what I recommend to people is that to the extent you can, eat unprocessed food. It fits nicely with the message to eat simply, eat locally, go to your farmer's market, uh, eat organically. Actually, phthalates are in pesticides as well. Um, and um, then not to bring things into your house uh, that you don't actually need. Um, so do you really need all these gadgets, all this plastic, all this polyvinyl? Can you buy a wooden toy instead of a, <laughs> a plastic toy? We should be careful with uh, plastic tubing and w with using uh, fresh vegetables instead of canned vegetables, never microwaving anything in plastic. Things of that sort are simple to use. And there are websites now that you can go to and, and they will tell you which cosmetics and which lotions and things are, are low in the kind of chemicals that we think are endocrine disrupting chemicals. I would particularly uh, recommend that uh, women, young women that intend to become pregnant or in pregnant women, that they, they should uh, read as much as they can about these things so they can avoid, for instance, uh, cosmetics. Uh, if I, I was a pregnant woman, I'm not sure I would use cosmetics. You and I could do a lot to avoid uh, some chemicals, perhaps by uh, getting information about uh, the products we eat, and uh, you could get information about cosmetics and so forth. But we cannot totally avoid getting these chemicals into us because uh, food is probably uh, a major source of uh, chemicals for us. That's very surprising to people. They say, well, how could plastic be in our food? material that comes in contact with food, in the processing of the food, in the packaging of the food, in the shipping, in the storage, in the cooking, any product that contains PVC will allow the food to pull off some of that PVC. We don't know exactly where this happens, but we do know by measuring food, as has been done in a number of studies, that it's in there. In British television, uh, they, they have made uh, some experiments. They looked at measured certain chemicals in uh, um, people who eat organic food and uh, live a very healthy life and compared this with uh, people in urban situations and very much to the shock of the people who eat organic food, they were higher in, in the levels of certain chemicals in their blood. They were very frustrated and dev devastated. How can this be? This is because there's certain exposure routes which we cannot control through individual decision-making. Even with the greatest will in the world, we can't totally protect ourselves from the great chemical invasion unless we decide to return to our roots and to our caves or to become part of an Amish community in the USA. We have studied a community near here. They don't use any 
plastic, and they grow their own food. They don't actually drive cars either. We've, they're also phthalates in cars. Um, and they have very low levels of phthalates and bisphenol A. One woman had a higher level of one phthalate because she used hairspray, even though it wasn't really what she was supposed to be doing. We saw that in her, in her urine. Um, they don't generally drive cars, but the two women that reported they had driven in cars recently had higher levels of some phthalates. So um, we know that you can, if you went to extremes, uh, you know, eliminate these. These are not permanent. These are not persistent chemicals. They're not like DDT. There's no way. Individual avoidance action will not protect you from exposure to these chemicals. And that is why it is so important that we need, that, that we have concerted, protective, political regulatory action. It is not possible without. We try to work as closely as we can with regulatory agencies to produce the best data that will be useful to them. But we don't have uh, an ability to tell them what to do. It is often very frustrating to see how little impact on political or regulatory action a lot of scientific work has had. This is true for uh, the area I work in, which is the health impact of uh, uh, chemicals. Um, but it is also true, say, for, for other areas, global warming, climate scientists. Um, for years, what they've said had zero impact on political action. In an ideal world, we would have never got to where we are today. And I think we got here because we just let industry put out chemicals without proper testing. Just to think that we can have 200 types of detergent, I, I don't think it's good. I think that, yeah, from the economical viewpoint, if I want to make my wealth or my life uh, selling detergent, I will have to make a detergent that is different from the one that Joe next door is selling, right? But how does it compare? I mean, my right to make a dollar or to make a, an euro with the right of other people not to be uh, intoxicated. So we have to decide certain things that are basic rights. It is not helpful to enter this dialogue by saying industrialists are vicious or personally bad or saying the same to regulators. It is the system. Hello. I'm Mr. Money. I'm Mr. Money. Now, it is understandable that uh, when we come along as scientists and say, excuse me, we think you should abandon production of this kind of chemical, uh, we will not be welcomed uh, with open arms. Everyone can see this. I'm a little concerned that we are just actively getting us to extinction because of the things we do in our arrogance. And it's a very bad combination being arrogant and ignorant. Yes, chemistry has changed the world we live in. If I developed a protocol and I would expose pregnant women and small children to small doses of pesticides, the doses that you would get in, in food or if you live nearby fields that are being sprayed and the drinking water is uh, polluted a little bit, um, and I went to the, my university ethical review committee and asked them, please, can I do this experiment? They would say, you're crazy. You cannot expose pregnant women and little children to those sorts of substances because there's a risk involved. These substances may be neurotoxic. And my problem is, this is what's happening already. And therefore, I think the only conclusion is that we are actually uh, committing something unethical. This experiment that we are, um, you know, part of, essentially, 
is unethical. It takes the determination of a society to make this change. Um, I think I have confidence that we can do this, but it's going to take everyone understanding why the old way isn't working anymore. It is a major change. Yeah. In this new world of industrial chemistry, the horizon is unlimited. Unexplored potentialities beckon. Hidden secrets of nature sound a call to this young man, the industrial chemist, the pioneer of tomorrow. <laughs>